All right, I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us on such a beautiful evening um, in the Chicagoland area. I'm Cindy Harn, Executive Director for the Nature Foundation of Will County, and I'll be your host tonight for our evening with Doug Talamy. If you're joining us from outside the Chicagoland area, or maybe you're new to our organization, the Nature Foundation is a nonprofit that raises money in support of the Forest Preserve District of Will County. We fund programs and initiatives that protect nature, inspire discovery, and bring people and nature together. If you're new to Zoom, you can adjust how you view this presentation in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And if you have a question tonight, just go ahead and type it in the chat box and we'll get to questions after Doug's presentation. We are recording and the presentation will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, I'll send out an email once it's posted. It will probably be up tomorrow or the day after. Um, Doug joined us all the way back in April to kick off our Learning Grow seminar series this year. And we started with Nature's Best Hope. And tonight he's our last presenter of the year and he wraps up our seminars with restoring the little things that run the world. We're incredibly grateful to him for sharing his knowledge and inspiring all of us to take action. We're also grateful for the amazing support and generosity of our donors and corporate partners. Uh, everything we do is funded by their generosity and their support keeps these seminars free of charge and it keeps our mission alive. So if you'd like to support our work, there's a link in your registration confirmation or you can visit our website at willcountynature.org. So aside from being an entomologist, ecologist, conservationist, author, and professor, Doug Tallamy is co-founder of the Homegrown National Park, a nonprofit organization committed to grassroots science-based solutions to the biodiversity crisis. Um, I just have a quick quote I wanna read from the page, um, the website, the Homegrown National Park, uh, in Doug's words. We are at a critical point of losing so many species from local ecosystems that their ability to produce the oxygen, clean water, flood control, pollination, pest control, carbon storage, et cetera, that is the ecosystem services that sustain us will become seriously compromised. Tonight, Doug shares with us why it's so important now more than ever for us to create beautiful landscapes brimming with life. Ladies and gentlemen, we will begin with Doug Tellamy and let me get rid of my share here. There you okay. go. Am I up? Yes, you are. All right, very good. Well, thank you, Cindy. Um, pleasure to be here tonight. It's a lovely night in Southeast Pennsylvania as well. Uh, and tonight I wanna to talk about, I, I call this making insects a guide to restoring the little things that, that run the world. And of course that phrase, it's not mine. That comes from Edward O. Wilson, E. O. Wilson, uh, Harvard Emeritus, who died the day after Christmas this year. So it's a terrible loss to uh, the field of, of conservation and entomology and sociobiology and all the other things he was involved with. But in 1987, he wrote this paper, The Little Things That Run the World, and his message was very clear, and that is that life as we know it depends on insects. Now, in 1987, I remember sitting in my office as an entomologist that was news to me. I mean, <laughs> we just weren't thinking about insects in, in that, that way. Uh, and most people continue to not think about insects that way. But what, what Wilson said was that if we lost our insects, we would lose most of the flowering plants. And if we lost most of the flowering plants, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that, that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those, those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers and all we'd have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. So it was a pretty somber message. Uh, but again, it was 1987. We spent a lot more time thinking about how we could kill all the insects around us than worrying about them disappearing. Besides, if we depend on insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? This was 1929, but uh, really our attitude hasn't changed much. This was a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals 
to rid the community of insects, not just pest insects, but all insects, got to get rid of them. And we, we tend to think that way even today. Well, if we succeeded, let's say we succeeded in killing all the in insects in agriculture and all the insects at home, many of us still wouldn't worry about losing insects because we have this idea that they are still very common in our natural areas. There are two reasons why um, that's no longer true, why we can't rely on our natural areas to make the number of insects we need to run our ecosystems any longer. And the first is that we don't have enough natural areas. We have turned them into our cities and they're not designed to support insects into our suburbs and they're not designed to support anything. Uh, and even our rural areas are not designed to support insects. We, we, we think of this as the country, but it's really fairly ecologically dead. And then of course we have agriculture. We have a lot of agriculture, just rangeland alone, 770 million acres uh, designed to support cattle, not designed to support insects, although it could uh, that's four and a half times the size of Texas uh, that is often overgrazed and not very productive. As a matter of fact, food production on terrestrial uh, earth now claims about half of terrestrial earth surface. And of course, that's not designed to support insects either. Then we do have those natural areas, but the second reason uh, that, that they're not supporting the insects, insect populations that we need is that uh, just about everywhere, those natural areas are heavily overrun with plants from other continents. This is a natural area near, near me at White Clay Creek State Park, and every bit of green you see in this picture is a plant from Asia, which leaves out before plants from North America. I took this picture in March, and that's how I know. Um, and that's multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and amur honeysuckle and, and uh, alanthus and Norway maple and, and um, autumn olive and miscanthus and barberry and on and on and on. They're all there. Most of these, by the way, are escapees from our, our gardens. Uh, important point to take away from this is that non-native plants destroy insect populations by replacing the native plants on which they depend. And our natural areas have been invaded by 3,300 species of plants from other continents. So big, big problem. Now, when I was young, sites like this were common. Uh, you older folks probably remember looking up at streetlights and there were insects flying all around them, or we drove in our cars and that's what our windshields looked like. No longer. That doesn't happen. Um, uh, pretty much anywhere. So we are winning the war against insects. It's an undeclared war, but we're winning it anyway. And that's why we see some pretty scary headlines like the insect apocalypses here, uh, where people are actually measuring insect declines around the globe. Uh, and and uh, the attention uh, really started with uh, declining honeybees, and then we started looking at, at uh, native bees. So for example, 50% of our Midwestern native bee species have disappeared from their historic ranges. There are four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% in the last 20 years. They're not extinct, but they're functionally extinct. They're no longer common enough to perform their roles in their ecosystems. There are three species of bumblebees that may already be extinct. And 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. Uh, no better off in Europe, 30% of Europe's orthopterans, the grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets are now facing extinction. Um, Great Britain has, has uh, always cataloged what's living there uh, better than we have. Three quarters of their butterflies are in steep decline. This is the V moth. It's lost 99% of its, its population, the Brighton wainscots, uh, and the bordered Gothic already extinct, and, and many others are in trouble. There's a big study came out of Germany. Uh, um, when? I don't know, 2017, something like that. It said uh, German insects have declined 79% since 1989, flying insects. There are 46 species of moths and butterflies that have disappeared from Germany. And invertebrate abundance, mostly insects, around the world has declined 45% since 1974. So the little things that run the world are disappearing. And of course, as, as insects decline, so do the birds that need them. Uh, breeding bird report, state of the birds report, said there's 432 species of North American birds that are threatened with extinction. They're threatened with extinction, um, not because there's only four or five left of each species, but because of the rate of decline. We learned from the passenger pigeon and uh, many other species, Alaskan curlew, that steep rates of decline uh, usually end up 
in extinction, even if the bird was once very common. There are 3 billion fewer breeding birds today than there were just 50 years ago. That's a Smithsonian study. Uh, so the news is not very good for our, our birds. We went to the original data set of that Smithsonian study, Rosenberg et al., and we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups. Uh, the ones that require insects, typically when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects during their life history. So things like uh, finches and doves can actually reproduce on seeds. They make a little milk out of seeds uh, and feed that to their young. And look, they didn't decline at all during the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects, the birds that cannot rear their young on seeds, uh, declined on average 10 million individuals per species. Doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose birds. In Great Britain, uh, they have sterilized their landscapes to such an extent that species that are highly invasive in other parts of the world, like the uh, house sparrow and starling, are now red listed. In, in Great Britain. Uh, so even invasive species can, can suffer from habitat decline. And the UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction um, probably in the next 20 years. And most of those will be insects. So the question is, does this matter? You know, if it doesn't matter, then eh, who cares? Uh, well, according to E.O. Wilson, it matters. The, the creatures that are keeping us alive are disappearing. Now, we humans are, are incredibly bad at reacting to long-term risks. If it's not happening now, we don't tend to, to react to it. Even if it is happening now, we often react pretty slowly. <clears throat> but we're pretty good at feeling empathy for, for other animals. So let's look at this problem from the perspective of a bird. What does insect decline? Um, how might that impact the birds around us? So let's do this by having you imagine that you are a magnolia warbler. You are a magnolia warbler and you have just finished overwintering in the Talamanca Mountains of Costa Rica. And you're about to undergo the uh, most dangerous thing you will ever do in your life and that is migration. It's dangerous because predation risks are high. Uh, it's extremely uh, it's energetically costly. Migrants lose up to 35% of their body weight per day. Uh, particularly when they're crossing the Gulf of Mexico, if they're flying north. Um, and of course, once they, they reach land, uh, they continue to, to migrate. And every time they come to a, a stopover point, they have to put that weight on or their migration is over. So they have to stop and eat 35 to 50% of their body weight at each uh, uh, rest stop. And of course, what they're eating is insects, particularly in the spring. Remember in the spring, the, bird, the, the plants haven't made any seeds or, or berries yet. So migration is tough on, on birds, and you might wonder, if it's so hard on birds, why did it evolve? That's a good question. Well, migration evolved for the same reason that anything evolves. The benefits of migration outweighed the costs. <clears throat> so what are the benefits of migrating? Migrants have more food. Um, you know, <laughs> this is what they have. They've got, they've got caterpillars to eat. Um, in the spring, you have the temperate zone uh, flushing out uh, new leaves and following that flush is a flush of the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And that is the food that fuels uh, bird migration in the spring. That doesn't happen in the tropics. The seasonal production of food is very constant in the tropics. There's a tremendous amount of competition for it uh, from the birds that do not migrate. So you don't have this sudden bonanza of food to take advantage of. Uh, but that bonanza that happens in the uh, uh, temperate zone gives birds the opportunity to actually make more babies. Uh, if they stay in the tropics, on average, they make two to four uh, offspring per year. But if they move to the temperate zone, they can make three to six. Now, it doesn't seem like a huge difference, but it's enough to offset the costs of migration. They actually um, have larger populations when they migrate. So, Bird migration was adaptive because there were so many insects in the temperate zone. How important are insects to birds? Well, this figure came out in 2018. Birds eat 500 million tons of insects each year. I have no idea how they measured that, but that was, that was the statement. And of course, their conclusion is, so look how important birds are to pests, which gets back to that idea that all insects are pests. And of course, that's not true. Let's rewrite that and say birds require 500 million tons of insects each year. And if there are not 500 million tons of insects each year, there will be fewer birds. 
So when migration evolved, there were plenty of insects in the temperate zone. Is that still true? Are there still enough insects in the temperate zone to justify, to, to balance the costs of migration? Uh, and the answer is every time we measure it, no, there are not enough. Let's just focus on the impact of introduced plants, which we have pretty much everywhere now. Uh, what is the impact on insect declines? Well, we've studied this in a number of different ways in, in my lab. This is one study that illustrates it pretty well. Simply went into hedgerows uh, in, in agricultural areas in Delaware, Maryland, and Pennsylvania, and measured the caterpillar community that are on these hedgerows when they're invaded with non-natives. So this one's got a lot of uh, autumn olive, uh, multiflora rose, and many other things in a typical hedgerow. And compare that to the caterpillars and hedgerows that are not invaded with Asian plants. The trick was finding these, and uh, that, was, that was hard. And when they were invaded by non-native plants, uh, caterpillar, uh, the number of species of caterpillars was reduced 68%. The abundance of caterpillars was reduced 91%. And the biomass, the actual energy that is in these hedgerows for, for birds was reduced 96%. <clears throat> So this loss of bird food in our typical invaded habitats doesn't affect just a few obscure bird species. Uh, it impacts 386 species of neotropical migrants that may no longer have enough insects to justify that migration. We're talking about swallows and swifts. We're talking about orioles and hummingbirds and vireos, tanagers, buntings, flycatchers, thrushes, those warblers, all those species of warblers, and many others depend on those insects. And a lot of people say, well, <clears throat> I don't have a property big enough for breeding birds uh, to actually reproduce. And, and that may be true. But if you have a property big enough for a single tree, you choose the right tree, it can help those migrating birds. They do stop over in those birds and those, those uh, trees, even on small properties. Uh, and if we choose trees like ginkgos that produce zero caterpillars, that's the end of the migration. They don't have enough to eat to continue on. So even small properties can make important contributions to migrants if we choose the plants that make those insects. And don't forget about the resident birds that don't migrate at all. <clears throat> Many of them, like chickadees and titmice, uh, eat, in, eat uh, seeds all winter long. About 50% of their diet is seeds in the wintertime. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. But when they go to reproduce, they can't rear their young on, on seeds. They switch to insects. And uh, it takes a lot of insects, particularly caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they, they can leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's, that's four pennies worth of bird. And when you want entire bird communities, you need a lot of, of insects out there. So what if I said to you, introduced plants are reducing your bank account by 96%. Uh, I wouldn't have to convince you very, very, uh, it would be easy to convince you that introduced plants are not, not very healthy for us. We depend on our bank accounts. Well, the point I'm trying to make here is that insects are the currency in our ecological bank account, and we depend on them as well. We can't afford to have these types of insect declines. Our ecological bank account, that's the one that's keeping us alive not those little paper bills. <clears throat> so our only viable option is to, is to find ways to live in harmony with the natural world that sustains us, find ways to live sustainably with the natural world that sustains us. And that has to be a world that includes insects. So how are we gonna do that? Uh, well, let's focus on private property. I talk a lot about private property because our, our parks and preserves are not doing the job. We do have parks, we have preserves, but we're in the sixth great extinction event. So obviously we need to now do conservation outside of parks and preserves on private property. Most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the, uh, the country east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're gonna fail. And I'm talking about properties like this, which are designed for aesthetics. Um, this, is a, this is a house near me. I took this from a helicopter uh, looking down. Got a very nice lawn and there's the guy taking care of it, but it is not uh, an ecologically vibrant uh, household. So how do we start by saving insects on properties like this? Well, first we have to understand what the causes of insect declines are. 
Uh, Dave Wagner calls calls insect declines death by a thousand cuts because there are so many different causes. Uh, misuse and overuse of pesticides, uh, certainly a cause. Habitat loss, that general law category thing. When you take away the, the place that insects need to live and the food they need, that's what habitat is. Then you're talking about habitat loss. Plant choice, the, the choices of plants that we use to landscape our, our human dominated landscapes is very important. <clears throat> and when we choose plants that become invasive, then invasive species become very important. They invade our natural areas uh, and push out the plants that support our insects. Light pollution turns out to be a very important cause of insect decline. And of course, climate change. And, and largely in terms of, of uh, droughts uh, and floods, you know, both of those things kill insects, uh, particularly the droughts that cause those fire, 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 those giant forest fires. All right, so we've got six major causes there. Um, this is actually good news, believe it or not, because five of those causes of insect declines can be addressed very simply at home by any property owner um, without a, a lot of trouble. Climate change is a tougher one, but let's focus on, on these. <clears throat> First, we have to decide which insects we're going to try to make at home. We have a lot of insects out there. We have, what do we have? We've got three to 4 million species worldwide and we're certainly not gonna have them all on our, our property. So which ones should we focus on? <clears throat> 164,000 species in the US alone. Well, there are two groups of insects that I, I think are more important ecologically than, than other groups. And that would be, group one would be the insects that maintain plant diversity. Uh, and then the insects that that take the energy from those plants, the energy that those plants capture from the sun and turn it into food through photosynthesis, the insects that then transfer that energy from those plants to uh, other, other animals, particularly vertebrates. We're talking about pollinators and we're talking about caterpillars. Now we hear a great deal about pollinators and I'm not gonna say a lot about them tonight because we hear a great deal about pollinators. I am gonna focus more on caterpillars because we don't hear a great deal about them. But let's start uh, with pollinators and talk about just the basics, like why do we need them? Uh, well, if you listen to the news, it will say because uh, pollinators, particularly bees, pollinate a third of our crops. <clears throat> well, May Berenbaum, the chairman of the, uh, the entomology department at, at the University of Illinois, tried to find the origin of that, that uh, statistic. You know, what study showed they pollinate a third of our crops uh, and, and May's very, very good with the literature. She knows how to find things, but she couldn't find that. She could not find the origin of that. So she did her own calculations and found that with a typical American diet, which is based heavily on uh, corn and wheat, which are wind pollinated, it's only about a 12th of our crops that depend on, on animals, particularly bees. So the real reason we need pollinators is not for our crops. It's, it's because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. And I like that explanation more than the crop one, because a lot of people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Yes, you do. We need pollinators every place we need plants, which is every place. Having pollinators around, being good stewards of pollinators is, is not uh, good stewardship. It's essential land stewardship. We cannot do without these things. So we have to stop being so casual about trying to save these essential parts of our, our ecosystems. Now we know how to, how to conserve uh, bee populations. And again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this, um, but we have to plant for, for uh, specialist bees. If you plant for only generalists, you lose the specialists. If you plant for specialists, the generalists can use those plants as well. Uh, and I'll tell you where to find information about what are the best plants for specialists later on. Uh, and we also need to plant a diversity of plants that provide pollen and nectar, particularly pollen, throughout the season. You know, if you have a plant that blooms for one week in the spring, um, you're helping some spring pollinators a little bit, but they need more than a week to complete their, their development. Uh, so we really need a sequence of blooming plants uh, from April all the way to October. All right, that's it for, for uh, bees. Let's talk about caterpillars. They are the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. If you have uh, a, a, an ecosystem without a lot of caterpillars, you have a failed food web and then eventually a failed ecosystem. And that's because caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of insect. 
So again, designing landscapes that don't don't support a lot of caterpillars is uh, a, a good way to uh, end up with ecosystem failure. So our goal is to increase the number of caterpillars in, in our yards. How do we do that? How do we do that? That's a new goal, by the way. You know, our yards in the past have been designed for uh, aesthetics only. We want them to be pretty. And also caterpillars were the, the enemy. If you saw one, you had to kill it because it might have a put a hole in you in one of your leaves. And that's not aesthetically pleasing. Well, now we need to find ways to have uh, beautiful yards that do support caterpillars. And the way you do that is add the plants that support those caterpillars, which seems pretty easy, uh, but there's a catch. And that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we wanna focus on the ones that do. For example, this is uh, elderberry in my yard. Uh, it's a great pollinator plant, makes wonderful berries for the birds. It's a terrible caterpillar plant. I can think of one species that eats, eats elderberry. So if you're trying to support bird reproduction in the spring, elderberry would not be the way to do it. Um, well, we have to be fussy about the plants that we choose because the caterpillars themselves are fussy and they're fussy because the plants have made them fussy. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. Um, in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? This is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only develop and reproduce on the particular plant lineages that they have developed very specialized adaptations for that help them get around those chemical defenses. So they develop spe specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify the chemical defenses in the leaves, behavioral, excuse me, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those chemicals. It takes a long period of exposure to those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is then locked into eating it. So once a, a, uh, the monarch became a specialist on milkweed, if you take the milkweed out of your yard and replace it with hosta, the monarch's not gonna be able to start to develop on hosta. It's locked into milkweed and it has two choices. It's gonna fly away and find milkweed someplace else or starve to death. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we're going to rebuild the food webs that support the, the insects, stop insect decline, reverse insect declines, we have to choose the right plants. So if we want the Pandora Sphinx, for example, we have to have Virginia creeper. If we want the tulip tree silk moth, we need the tulip tree. I mean, these are all specialists that require particular plants. Luna moths, uh, depending on where you are in the country, at my, in my yard, they depend on, on sweet gum. Uh, and that's true for most of their Eastern populations. The zebra swallowtail will only develop on, on pawpaws. Eight-spotted forester moth uh, is a grape specialist, along with many other things. Green marvel on viburnum, the brown hooded owlet on goldenrod, the beautiful utilia on poison ivy. If you want this, this, this moth and many others, you have to have poison ivy. And I know people say, oh, I don't want to get poison ivy. Do you know when you get poison ivy? You get it when you try to get rid of it, when you try to pull it out. Just ignore it. You can run faster than it can. The best defense against poison ivy is to learn how to recognize it and then simply not touch it. Get the sculpture moth on persimmon, the Hebrew on black gum, the fawn sphinx on ash, our poor beleaguered ashes. There are 95 insects that, that are specialists on ashes and we'll lose all of them if we lose our ashes to the emerald ash borer. Rosy maple moth on, on maple, the royal walnut moth on walnut and hickory. And this, this poor fella is already extirpated from New England. So we are losing these insects. Double tooth prominent on, on elm, one, two teeth right there. Witch hazel dagger moth is a specialist on witch hazel, believe it or not. The imperial moth on pine, even native clematis has specialists like the spotted thyrus. Two-toned ancillus on ironwood, the lost uh, owlet on buttonbush. These are just examples. The herald on native willows, 
Snowberry clearwing and coral honeysuckle. These are all specialists in my yard, by the way. The evening primrose moth is a specialist of evening primrose. The moth comes and sticks its head in the flowers. It's very cute. And sometimes it gets crowded in there. Um, showy emerald on, on uh, sumac, the native sumacs. And I don't mean um, poison sumac. I've never even seen poison sumac. I'm talking about things like smooth sumac and staghorn sumac, <coughs> wing sumac, great soil stabilizers. Then we have some real powerhouses, things that are producing lots of different insects, like native prunus, things like black cherry. We'll give you the white furcula, the crocus geometer, the io moth, the beautiful cecropia moth, the colorful zaley, the tufted bird dropping moth. I mean, who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth in their yard? The paddle caterpillar. Tell your kids to go out and find a cat paddle caterpillar on black cherry and, and tell them to figure out what those paddles are for. They're not there for decorations. There's a, there's a reason they're there. Uh, get them to think about it. Uh, and I'm not gonna tell you what that reason is. I want you to think about it too. It's the same reason that the filament geometer has these retractable filaments, kind of like the, the hydra um, that go in and out. Then you have the small-eyed sphinx, Harris's three spot that uses uh, this, this umbrella-like structure, old, old head capsules after it sheds uh, as a club, it whips it back and forth and slaps you if you try to touch it. Um, and then we have oaks, the most productive plant uh, in, the, in the entire country, producing things like the, the hag moth, kind of looks like a tarantula, the red washed caterpillar, the white dotted prominent, the spiny oak moth, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, solitary oak leaf miner, orange patch smoky wing, the half oval ancillus, the crown slug. These guys are called slug caterpillars because their head is tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. Pink striped oak worm, the spun glass slug, which I think is the prettiest caterpillar in the entire country. Uh, and literally hundreds more species are uh, dependent on, on oaks, which is why I call oaks uh, the best of the keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is? That's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. When you take it out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, keystone plants are making most of the food in our local food webs. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the food that drives those food webs. 14% are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So I think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that I'm building uh, here at home as the, the pillars, they're the two by fours that hold that house up. They're essential. Uh, and nothing does it better than, than oaks. In the mid-Atlantic states where I live, they support 557 species of caterpillars, more than 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant uh, genus that comes close to that. There you go. They are the two by fours that, that uh, hold up our ecological houses. You know, in the past, we've been trying to build our ecological houses out of wallpaper, and that doesn't work. You're not through building your house after you've, you've uh, put in your keystone plants, but um, they're an essential component of it. How do you find out what the keystone species are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website and put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most important woody plants and the most important uh, herbaceous plant genera in your county will pop up. And the list will look something like this. Um, they're abbreviated because I ran out of room, um, but uh, they're ranked in terms of the number of caterpillars that they support. Uh, let's look at these. These guys, Solidago, Asters, Helianthus, rank very high. Not only do they produce the most caterpillars, but they also are best in terms of supporting those specialist bees that I mentioned. Um, with those four, three genera alone, you can have about 44 species of specialist bees that won't be in your yard with, without them. Where did I take all those pictures? I took them in my yard. And this is what our yard looked like uh, uh, very shortly before we moved in. We were in a, a farm that had been broken up into 10 acre lots, it had been mowed for hay before we moved in. So very few plants there. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. Uh, we put a lot of the plants back. And because we put the plants back, the caterpillars that drive those food webs have come back. And I know that because I have been counting the number of species of caterpillars that occur at our yard. Uh, for the last five years, taking pictures of them. And I'm up to 1,184 species, just of moths, have not gotten to the butterflies yet. Uh, so we started with pretty much nothing, and that's how many species we have now, which means you can put it back together again. You can put it back together and just by providing the plants that these insects need. Uh, and we did that by planting witch hazel and oaks and persimmon and elms and maples and all of these things that were not in our yard beforehand 
and tolerating a lot of things that were, but a lot of people think are weeds, things like black cherry considered weeds, native grapes, a lot of people pull them down. Uh, Virginia creeper, people don't like Virginia creeper, but it's a very productive plant. Goldenrod, even the poison ivy, um, greenbrier, these are all important plants. Dotter, it's a parasitic plant, but it supports a number of, of, uh, of moths. So that's how we rebuilt those food webs. And because we added so many uh, uh, moth caterpillars to our yard, that's bird food. Uh, we have added the birds that eat those food. Uh, things like the, the wood thrush. Remember, we were starting from bare ground. Now we've got a forest species that is breeding in our yard uh, because we've got things like Virginia creeper making uh, the lettered sphinx, and that's what they use to reproduce. Um, indigo bunnings, because we have alders making ruby quakers, chipping sparrows, because we have black walnut making gray edged boma locas, field sparrows, because we have oaks making red line panapoters and many other species. We've got chip mice breeding because we've got black cherry making dowdy pinions. We've got Phoebes because we've got native grasses supporting skippers and many other types of, of insects. Robins eating all the moths they get from those weeds. <clears throat> weeds, uh, you know, they're native plants. Definition of a weed is a, is a plant out of place and native plants are not plants out of place in North America. We've got chickadees, Carolina chickadees breeding because we have tulip trees making tulip tree beauties. These are the different species that are in these birds' beaks. We've got white-eyed vireos because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtail. House wrens because we have hickories making copper underwings. <clears throat> and of course, bluebirds because we have sycamores making drab prominence. 60 species of birds have been recorded breeding on our, our 10 acres. Not flying by, but, but breeding. I'm telling you this because this is another headline we see all the time. Uh, and that's that the World Wildlife Fund says the earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house. Uh, at our house, I'm sure we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. <clears throat> So these are scary statistics, but we can turn them around if we all put the plants back, all of us. So by choosing the right plants, by using more of them, we really could restore insect populations nearly everywhere. The good thing about insects, they, they reproduce quickly uh, when we give them the proper host plants and the proper weather. I'm going to end by talking about nine things that you can do to restore uh, ecosystem function in your yard by uh, returning insects to your yard. Um, and we'll talk about each one of them. How about cutting your lawn in half? You've heard me talk about reducing lawn a number of times, but it's, it's critically important because we have so much acreage dedicated to ecological deadscape. <clears throat> we have an area the size of New England, bigger than the size of New England, um, dedicated to, to lawn. And it, it it's a status symbol. I understand that. And we also need lawn to display our, our Halloween decorations. Uh, I understand that as well. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? Uh, that's when we could create a homegrown national park. We could take areas like this. You know, here's a church in Mississippi where everybody's inside uh, worshiping God's creations. And on the outside, they're killing them all. It doesn't make any sense. And they're only doing it because we're not, we're not thinking. So we can cut the area of lawn, create a homegrown national park by doing that. We wanna plant for those specialist bees. Sam Drogi is the one that's pointed, pointed this out. He's, he's Mr. Native Bee. Uh, and he said, you know, if we plant for our specialist bees, we're meeting the needs of the, the uh, generalists as well, because they will use those plants. Just watch your goldenrod right now. Tomorrow when you go outside, it's all in bloom. Um, you'll see the specialist bees come, but you'll also see a number of the, the generalist bees, including honeybees, come to, to goldenrod. Same thing with sunflowers, same thing with asters, enothera, many other plants. Um, you can find your list of, of uh, the top uh, producing plants for specialist bees by going to uh, another feature of um, National Wildlife Federation website it's called Keystone Plants by Ecoregion. Uh, and you you look at what ecoregion in right now it's it's um, it's pretty coarse uh, it's divide uh, most of the first half of the country is in ecoregion level one um, we're going to push that up to ecoregion level two and get a little bit more fine grain but still you have a very good idea of the plants that are best for supporting those those specialists by looking at that website remove invasive species from your property almost every property has plants on it that are actually invasive. 
And I've heard people say, you know, I planted that burning bush in my yard and it hasn't moved at all. So it's not invasive. Well, it hasn't moved, but its seeds have moved. Um, it's highly invasive. Same with calorie pear, same with, with barberry, same with all those guys, autumn olive, porcelain berry, don't get into porcelain berry. Uh, and these plants invade uh, the, the natural areas around us. But if most of the country is privately owned and everybody got rid of the invasive plants off their private property, uh, we would be largely done. And then we could start dealing with the problem on, on public lands. Uh, but it doesn't make any sense to to full with public lands when we've got everybody supporting them, harboring these these ecological terrorists on our yards, and actually going to nurseries and, and buying them. So it's your responsibility to get rid of those invasive plants uh, and replace them with keystone plants uh, out of that that website that we talked about. By the way, here the the well, there's a lot of invasive plants, but English ivy, when I started talking about this uh, well, almost 20 years ago, uh, a lot of people at talks would say, you know, you can use English ivy in the East. It's not invasive. It's only invasive in, in uh, Oregon. Well, of course, that was utter nonsense. It's invasive everywhere. And now the East is covered with English ivy as well. Calorie pear, porcelain berry, burning bush, privet, um, Chinese elm, glossy buckthorn, emmer honeysuckle, and many others are very serious uh, in, invasive plants that uh, we really don't want to have in our, our yards. Keystone plants, we talked about that. Um, landscape for caterpillars, we didn't talk about that yet. What does that mean? Well, this is an example. Um, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oak support is actually 211 species or 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon, hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species finish developing on the tree or finish growing as a caterpillar on the tree, but then they drop from the tree and wiggle their way beneath the surface of the soil to pupate underground, um, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. Uh, and that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't, we don't tolerate it. We mow and compact our soils so that they're rock hard, really hard for those caterpillars to get, get underground. Uh, and of course, the cement landscape is not going to help them either. So what most people do, have a tree in a yard. I have a grad student uh, starting this summer who is going to measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee you they're going to do better in a situation like this, where you have a tree and then a layered landscape, maybe a, a, a dogwood, native azalea, ferns, ground cover. This is soft landing sites for these caterpillars. They fall down, they can easily get below the surface of the soil because the soil is not compacted. Nobody's gonna mow them, nobody's gonna step on them. A lot of leaf litter down there, they can spin their cocoon, much higher survivorship. This is where you can use, do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening, make beautiful gardens and reduce the lawn at the same time. You put big beds around all your trees, that's how you reduce the lawn and you're making safe sites for those caterpillars. Um, use use uh, native ground covers liberally. This is wild ginger, uh, mayapple, foam flower, ferns, many others. Virginia creeper is good ground cover. Uh, so if you see the ground, you don't have enough plants there. Uh, and that's exactly what those caterpillars need when they drop from the tree. Reduce your light pollution. I mentioned that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect decline. Uh, if we if we put in the plants to produce those insects, but then have lights on at night, we're gonna we're gonna kill them. So that doesn't make any sense. These are all the ways that uh, light pollution at night kills insects. But it's actually good news to me because it provides a very convenient way for reducing uh, insect losses. Um, all we have to do is flick a switch, turn those lights out, or uh, we can also put a motion sensor on our, our security lights. A lot of people say, you know, I can't turn my light out over my barn or my, my garage or my front porch because the bad man will come. But if you put a motion sensor on it, it will only turn on when the bad man does come. And you'll save a lot of, a lot of energy and a lot of insects. Another very easy thing to do is simply take out the white bulb and put in a yellow bulb. You get 60 watt yellow bulb at, at uh, Ace Hardware and a number of other places. Um, not expensive at all. And it really, insects are not attracted to yellow wavelengths. And they sell these as LEDs as well. They'll really cut down on, on insect mortality by that simple change. Uh, here's a happy homeowner who's just put a yellow light in her front, front yard. And look, no insects. Oppose mosquito spraying. 
uh, you know, these mosquito fogging companies are, um, it's a booming business all over the country. Uh, and, the, you know, they say it's okay. As a matter of fact, they're advertising. I got an email today. Where is it from? I can't remember, but they're saying um, that this is this is a natural control for mosquitoes. So it implies that it's safe. Uh, well, it is a natural product. It's pyrethroids. Uh, it comes from chrysanthemums. It's industrial steak py pyrethroids. But, you know, pyrethroids are in chrysanthemums to kill the insects that eat chrysanthemums. Uh, and that's what, what mosquito fogging does. Uh, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with. Uh, they say it's natural, and it is, but so is cyanide, a natural product in plants. So I don't think that's a good argument. They also say it only kills mosquitoes, and that is uh, just not true at all. They kill all the insects, including monarchs, by the way. Big monarch kills when they fly through, through uh, mosquito fogging. Uh, and it doesn't control mosquitoes. That's the frustrating part of it. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill uh, ninety percent of the mosquitoes, of the adult mosquitoes. Uh, these these foggers kill between ten and fifty percent of the mosquitoes. So it's not even close to actually working. So they have to keep coming back and back, and again killing all the insects in your yard. If you really want to kill insects. Try a biocontrol using mosquito dunks. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in it in some organic matter, a handful of straw or hay or, or uh, some, some uh, dead leaves, maybe even some dead grass. Uh, put it out in the sun and it will grow algae and diatoms. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. So the adult mosquitoes are really attracted to this. The females lay their eggs in there. After they've laid their eggs, you put it out for a couple of days. Then you go to the hardware store and buy a sheet of mosquito dunks. $9, $12, something like that. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. You put it in the bucket and um, it's a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So if a dragonfly gets in there, it doesn't hurt it a bit. If your dog drinks, it doesn't hurt it. Put a coarse screen over your bucket so that uh, the chipmunk doesn't jump in and, and drown. But if everybody did this, we would cut down uh, mosquito populations cheaply and, and in a very targeted way that doesn't kill everything else. This works as well, folks. It doesn't kill the mosquito populations, but it will keep them off you. If you're sitting in your backyard, you wanna have a picnic or something, get the old fashioned fan, plug it in, creates a strong enough wind that the mosquitoes can't uh, fly into it. Very cheap way to enjoy your yard during mosquito season. Minimize insecticide use overall. It's not just uh, mosquito fogging that we depend on. Uh, homeowner use of insecticides is, is tremendous. We, we have entomophobia. If we see an ant, if we see a spider, which is not an insect, but it eats insects. Um, if we see anything in our yard, we go, we buy the, the pesticide and we spray it everywhere, which means half the time we're living in an envelope of poison ourselves, just so we don't have to look at that insect which nine times out of 10 isn't hurting anything. The only time we actually need to control insects in our, our houses is termites. Uh, and there are very specified baits now that, that do that in, in pretty safe ways. So try to just get rid of all that stuff that you've, you've bought. And you know we buy a lot of it when you go to the hardware store because the shelves are lined with this stuff. Uh, no bug zappers, bug zapper. I thought we dealt with this decades ago. We did a study way back in 19, 96 that found that these bug zappers um, only kill 0.02% of the insects that we're targeting of, of biting flies. 99.98% of the insects killed by bug zappers are not biting flies, not mosquitoes or any other kind of biting fly. So you're killing lots of insects, just not the ones you want to kill. Um, not necessary, not, not accomplishing anything. Here's something that actually works. It's, it's a mosquito racket. Um, I believe there's batteries in here. It's electrified. You just swing it at the mosquito and it gets the mosquito and nothing else. You can give that a try. Oops, come back here. Then finally, um, we want to change the rules in the places we live that discourage ecological landscaping. So we want to, to uh, join our HOAs, our civic associations and change from within. Uh, the the rules that say, well, you're not allowed to, to um, you have to, you know, your lawn has to be gigantic and has to be half inch high and you have to use non-native plants. Um, those rules were made back in the 70s when we we're trying to increase the status symbol of our neighborhoods. We didn't want rusty cars in the front yard and things like that. Uh, but they were not made by ecologists. They were not made when we were having um, 
the sixth great extinction on planet Earth. We got we to turn this around now. And the way to do it is to actually educate the people that make these rules. And I'm getting emails from people who've done this. They've joined their HOA. They explain what the problems are. And, and people are listening to them. The rules are lightening up. So that's great. Okay, I want to end with E.O. Wilson, the way we started with E.O. Wilson. Way back in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. Uh, and his message was very, very clear. It, it was um, a culmination of his lifelong work to save life on planet Earth. And he said, you know, all the science points to the fact that if, you, if, you, if we don't save functioning ecosystems, if we don't save nature on half of the planet, we're going to lose nature. We're going to lose life on all of the planet. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. Uh, but then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we could actually do that. Now to, to conservation biologists, that's certainly good news. We'll just put half the earth aside and everything will be great. But remember, half of terrestrial earth is already in some form of agriculture. And we've got, uh, what, nearly 8 billion people in the other half with all of our roads and our airports and our detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for, for nature. So how can we possibly do this? Uh, well, we can do it. I think we can realize EO's dream of, of saving half the earth, but we need a new approach to conservation. And that means we have to give up the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist. That's, that's been something we depended on uh, for a long time that, that uh, you know, we had to expel nature from all of our living spaces. Uh, that's not working at all. So we now need to find ways for them to coexist at the same place at the same time. That doesn't mean that we have to save insects for a living, but we certainly can save them where we live. And when we do, it empowers us. The earth's problems are huge and most people feel absolutely powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can do all the things we just talked about. You can shrink the lawn, you can fire mosquito joe, you can, you can get rid of the invasive plants in your property, you can turn out your lights, you can plant pollinator gardens, you can use keystone plants. All of those things will increase the insect populations and the ecological vibrance of your local, of your property. Uh, and then that will enhance your greater local ecosystem. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire world's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a park or preserve land conservancy. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So insect decline is a global problem, but it does have a grassroots solution. It's a problem that we created, but it's a problem that we, each one of us, can solve. Thanks very much. Thanks, Doug. If you've got some questions, please type them into the chat. Um, could you talk a little bit about the homegrown national park movement and your, your 20 20 million acres goal, that would be great. Sure. Um, that was the initial goal for Homegrown National Park. Uh, I, it's actually a long time ago. It was the first time I heard that statistic about how many acres of lawn that we have. We've got, right now, it's about 44 million acres of lawn in the U.S. I said, well, what would happen if we cut that in half? They'll give us 20 million acres to work with. How big is 20 million acres? And I started to add up the, the size of all the major national parks in the country. And you add them all up and it's still less than 20 million acres. So I said, well, gee, that's huge. Um, we can create a new national park. And if we do it at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. Um, and that's what I did. I talked about it. But uh, I met uh, Michelle Alfandari, who um, actually had a, a branding uh, licensing business in, in uh, Manhattan. And uh, she moved to Connecticut. She, she'd been in Manhattan, what, 40 years? Got, got tired of it. But she was not into nature. She was not into, you know, biodiversity, didn't understand any of that. But she she heard me give a talk and said, you're not you're not going to succeed unless you get beyond the choir. You're only talking to the choir, which is true, because only the choir invites me. But she said, we've got to get this message to all the people who don't know that they're an important part of conservation. So 
we need to use uh, social social media and marketing and all these things. And I said, I don't do that, Michelle. That's just not what I do. And she said, but I do do that. And that's what I'm going to help you do. So we, we started uh, largely through her efforts to create the, the nonprofit Homegrown National Park um, organization. So you can find it with our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. And this feature we call the map. We want to map everybody who joins uh, Homegrown National Park, and it's free, by the way. You register your property. And uh, the amount of area that you're going to either remove invasives from, plant natives in, or both. Uh, and your little piece of your county will then light up. Um, and the object is to get the entire country to light up so we can see where the gaps are, see where we can, you know, we need to re recruit new members to build biological corridors, um, to create a social movement so that people can feel like they're part of a successful conservation effort. There are a lot of conservation efforts out there. Um, and, and, you know, the <laughs> Nature Foundation of, of Will County is one of them, but, um, they're all separate and people don't realize how they could all be put together. So this is our, our effort to unite all of these conservation efforts, get them to light up on our map, uh, and in so doing, excite a bunch of other people who don't realize they're an important part of the future of conservation. So if you're not part of, of Homegrown National Park, please consider joining. Great. I will um, send out an email after the presentation with the link to the video. And then there were a couple different websites that you mentioned and uh, I'll send the information on Homegrown National Park too. So everyone can get uh, signed up and um, be part of the movement. Um, I have a question from Haley. If Great. I have mature trees, what's the best way to add layers under the tree without damaging the tree's root system? Okay, that's a good question. Um, you know, it depends on the amount of shade that your trees are, are throwing. So for example, if you have a couple of hemlocks, they throw a lot of shade and very few things are gonna grow under them. Um, oaks can throw a lot of shade, but not nearly as much. You can have successful ground covers uh, under them. One thing I've learned at, at my house is that trees really grow. Uh, and what I thought I was planting on the edge of the canopy spread 10 years ago is now, <laughs> it seems very close to the trunk. So you wanna plant, uh, shrubs and things farther away from the base of that tree, and then the tree will grow up over them, but there'll be enough light coming through. Plant those plants small so you're not digging deep roots, and it won't hurt the tree roots if you do it that way. Um, you can experiment. So a lot of these ground covers, you know, the roots are, are very shallow. Sometimes there'll be competition for uh, light or for, for water, and it won't work out. But I'll tell you what a wonderful ground cover is that, that everybody can have, and that's simply leaf litter. Uh, ferns are very easy to establish under trees in low, low light. Um, so there are a number of things that, that can, can work even when you have uh, fairly, fairly dense shade. One thing that's underutilized and can even bloom in the shade is hydrangea arborescens. It's a native hydrangea. You wanna get the straight species, not Annabelle, because Annabelle is uh, it's a cultivar that is sterile um, and it doesn't help the pollinators at all. But if you're looking for a blooming plant in, under a tree that has pretty, pretty good shade, uh, I highly recommend that. Um, next question is, why do I see bees on Russian sage? Well, we've got honeybees, which are not native either, uh, but, Bees need two things. They need pollen and they need nectar. They need nectar, which is sugar water for energy. And just like hummingbirds that will come to our plastic hummingbird feeders, they don't care where they get it as long as their mouth parts work in the ne nectar source. So we have long tongue bees and short tongue bees. Where they specialize is not on the nectar, they specialize on the pollen. So they might go to a number of flowers to get nectar, but they can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants, at least those specialists. Now we do have pollen generalists as well, but uh, my guess is that a lot of the bees you see on non-native plants are honeybees, and many of our bumblebees are fairly generalized as, as well. Um, Doug, you gave a couple of suggestions for native um, trees and shrubs in the presentation. Um, one of the things, one of the species on there is the prunus species, but a lot of people tend to shy away from that because it, it's 
you know, can be, um, I don't know if aggressive is the right word, but it can really spread and get a little bit out of control, especially if you're looking at a landscape that you want to have somewhat maintained. So what are your recommendations for incorporating something like that, um, which is absolutely really helpful to the ecosystem, um, but balancing that with some of the aesthetics? Well, you know, when you talk about uh, the prunus that are spreading rapidly, you're talking about black cherry and maybe uh, pin cherry. They make a lot of those little, little berries and the birds love them. They poop them out everywhere. Uh, they are really powerful plants, but there's also American plum, which is uh, a prunus. There's actually several species of plums as you move into the, the Midwest. I looked at the uh, distribution of prunus in Oklahoma just the other day. There must have been 10 different species, uh, which which are more closely related to plums than 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 uh, cherries, black cherries. So they're not they don't have that big uh, weedy problem. Some of those plums, like American plum, are stoloniferous. They will they will spread, but it's on, it's another good way. People are looking at ways to reduce their lawn, is to get these these big spreading, low growing plants that will take up a lot of space that used to be lawn, but they can do it in a productive way. Bottle brush buckeye is another great one uh, to do that. You can use you can eat up a lot of lawn with those those types of plants, without having that that uh, you know seed spreading weediness. Um, Barbara says, I was in rural Western Illinois near Mississippi River three to four years ago. I was excited to see bug splatter on my windshield. I had not seen that in 40 to 50 years, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, that's a good place to see it is along a river, particularly if those bugs were mayflies. We still have mayfly emergence that can come out in big numbers. And if you're there at the right time, you do get some, some splatter. Yeah, you know, the insects aren't gone but they are declining. But the fact that they're not going gives us the chance to turn it around. And believe it or not, um, aquatic insects are doing better than terrestrial insects. We used to worry about water pollution all the time. We, we still should, but um, we've got things squared away enough in our aquatic systems that they're producing pretty good insect numbers. Uh, and many of those are what's maintaining our swallow and swifts and marten populations, all those insects coming out of aquatic areas. Um, at least in the east, our grasshoppers are really disappearing. Um, I don't know if it's neonicotinoids or, or whatever, but that's that's a big hit. So we're counting on those 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 marshlands, those rivers to to hold things up until we put the terrestrial areas back back together again. You mentioned leaf litter under trees, but what about the jumping worm? Yeah, we don't <laughs> we don't want jumping worms. Um, <laughs> Well, jumping worms eat leaf litter. You know, that's that's another invasive, well, it's three or four species of invasive worms that we brought in from Asia. Um, I talked to a couple of worm specialists. There's fewer all the time because they're so hard to work with and they're getting discouraged. The only positive news I've had heard about jumping worms is that they don't like oak leaf litter. Oak leaf leaves are a uh, little, little, too tough for them. Now I've heard people say, oh, they eat mine. But on average, when you when you have a good thick layer of oak leaves, you uh, push those those worms out. So it's another reason to get oaks into your, your landscape. But um, if you have the worms already, I don't have a quick fix for that. It's just, you know, people are working on it, but it is a terrible problem. Um, Ralph asks, you've talked about keystone species. I have a small yard. Can you give me four key keystones? Well, I always start with oaks. Uh, you know, you can write down the list of, of your, your trees. First of all, woody plants uh, support more caterpillars than herbaceous plants. So we would start with, with Quercus, with Prunus, with Salix. Our native willows are right there with, with Salix at the number two level. You know, our pines are very high, our maples are very high, our birches are very high. The common trees that dominate our forests are all ranked very high. The best uh, keystone herbaceous. You know, you, we can then divide keystones into which ones are supporting the most pollinators versus which ones are supporting the most caterpillars. I like the ones that do both. And that's why I talk about goldenrods, asters, and, and uh, helianthus, uh, sunflowers, and enothera. Um, uh, evening primrose, 
those four genera alone are great with the pollinators and the caterpillars. So there's eight or nine for you to choose from. As far as bushes go, let's add viburnums in there, and native viburnums. They support over 100 species of, of caterpillars, and you know it's not a tree. Um, Haley says, I'm adding a lot of native trees to my landscape and read in the nature of oaks that 10 foot is the appropriate distance between trees when planting saplings. I love this because it means I can plant more trees. However, it feels like such a small distance when thinking how massive these trees will get. Are there situations where 10 foot is too close? Are there situations where we should plant closer than 10 foot? <laughs> well, good question. The 10 foot recommendation is designed to get the trees close enough so that they will interlock their roots um, to create a stable tree grove. <clears throat> if you walk through the forest, an undisturbed forest, you will see a number of big trees growing practically next to you, almost touching each other. Uh, so everything isn't doing that. There's spaces between them, but you get these little groves of, of trees. Uh, and I've got a number of pictures of, of them uh, that do quite well interlocking their roots together and, and making a very stable planting. It's a different aesthetic because you're only, you can't look at each one of those individually. They're not specimen trees, they're, they're tree groves. And that's what that recommendation is all about. So the next time you get those straight line winds, a derecho coming through, it doesn't knock every tree down in your entire community, which it did in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, what, two years, three years ago? You know, they lost I don't know what, 50,000 trees or something. It was just, it was massive because every tree we plant is isolated. So that's designed to, to uh, do that. It doesn't mean we have no role for, for specimen plants anymore. If you say, I want this uh, oak to be a grand old oak 200 years from now, you better put it out in the full sun, not near anything else. Uh, but trying to get people to consider putting things together uh, a little bit closer. Can you plant them even closer? I've got pictures of two big white oaks uh, that are three feet apart. Um, I've got pictures of three three red oaks that are touching each other. <laughs> so yeah, you can get them closer too, but I think 10, 10 feet is a good, good compromise on that. And yes, their canopies will overlap. Um, should I use garden center herbicides? Lots of people discourage them, but sometimes I just can't get rid of a bad plant without them. Yeah, um, the herbicide question. Now notice when I said pesticides uh, were a problem, it's the misuse of pesticides and that includes herbicides. They are an important tool in our management toolbox. We run into problems when we overuse them or, or misuse them. Uh, so there are a number of invasive plants like Japanese knotweed, um, well, it's just a, like, like oriental bittersweet. It, you're never going to get rid of them unless you kill the root system. Uh, and, you know, there are different ways to do that, but the fastest, most reliable way is to use herbicide. I don't spray because I always hit non-targets. What I do is I cut and I paint. It's using very little material. Uh, but you're much more likely to kill the root system and then be able to get those native plants back. Um, so I consider herbicides to be like chemotherapy. These things are ecological tumors. We've got to get rid of them. Um, and we have to use a poison to do it. So, you know, I say have to. It's much easier to do that's more effective and you get, get to a better solution. Uh, would I rather not use the poison? Absolutely. But you know, uh, you know, we 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 we're all getting older. When you cut these plants down without killing the roots, you're doing it forever. They never go away. So. Uh, Ralph says, "I like your idea of green mulch plants under trees. Is wood mulch a bad thing? Bare soil is a bad thing. So wood mulch uh, covers that soil, uh, but you can get." Wood mulch that's laid on too thickly and you get a, a dry spell, go poke at it. It's all fused together. It's really hard stuff. Yes, it preserves more moisture in the soil and that's the goal. Uh, but it is not returning nutrients to the soil the way leaf mulch would. Leaves, leaves are, you know, they break down and return the nutrients that that tree used. Wood chips actually pull nutrients out of the soil. It takes nitrogen to break them down. 
Uh, so you end up with a, a nitrogen deficit when you use a lot of wood chips. I know it's convenient to use them because uh, Asplen and other country companies will just dump them in your yard and you get them. But ecologically, um, leaf litter is, is much better and then green mulch. Um, Ralph also says your pictures are amazing. I have a lot of natives that you mentioned, but don't see the insects you show. I hope they're there. How do you see and photograph them? Well, I don't do it all on the same day. Uh, these are things I run into, and a lot of times I feel lucky uh, when I do, but um, a lot of insects are out at night. You don't see them during the day because they're hiding from the birds. So go out with a flashlight at night uh, and look up in the trees and you will see a lot more than you do during the day. Many, many, particularly these caterpillars will crawl off the leaves during the day and hide on the bark. Some of them crawl totally off the tree uh, because they don't want to be found. Others are really cryptic. They blend in with the bark and they blend in with diseases on the leaves and they're very hard to see. So you have to form a search image. If they taste good, they will always be in the underside of the leaf. Um, so you're never gonna see them sitting on the top. It's just uh, knowing when and where to look. The worst time to look for, for insects on trees is in the springtime because the birds have eaten them all. The best time is probably uh, the first two weeks of August, maybe last week of July. That's when the populations are, are highest. <clears throat> so put all that together and you should see a lot more insects. Right. Um, can black cherry be pruned or coppiced in some way to keep it smaller? I planted some, but it's in too small a space for a full size tree. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned coppice. Black cherry can, a lot of trees can, oaks can as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I did that with a cherry that that uh, rooted itself near my my back porch. I had so many so many caterpillars on it, I never took it down, and then it got way too big. So I just just cut it off maybe two feet up, uh, and now it's a it's a really thick cherry bush. And boy, did, that was really productive this year. You can coppice something for a hundred years. Just keep cutting it back, uh, and it will it will keep growing up. So that's a very good point. Um, Tracy asks, are there any good native plants with strong enough root systems that can be used for a seawall to prevent erosion on a riverbank or creek? Well, lots of trees uh, will prevent erosion on, on steep banks and, and river, river situations. So uh, I would say almost any tree will do that. Sycamores are great at doing that. Uh, river birches are great at doing that. You want something, silver maples are great at doing that, but oaks are great at doing that as well. Um, you know, uh, swamp white oak or pin oak, that's, that's the oak of the swamp. But really it's plants in general that hold that, that stabilize that, that bank. But uh, the streams around here, around my house, it's sycamores that are doing the, the majority of that work. Um, back to the coppicing, when is the best time to do it? Well, I, I would say the winter time, uh, because in the winter time, all the nutrients have been pulled back into the root system. So when you cut it off in the winter time, then they're there and they can, can uh, you'll have a great flush of growth in the spring. Right. On the topic of climate change, should we be planning on changing some plant picks to accommodate? Um, I know it takes time to recognize, but should I be looking at looking a planting zone down and give it a try? Is it has there been some shift with our planting zones? Our plants are shifting, uh, but plants don't move very fast. Um, the, that's called assisted migration. And if you do it on, on a, you know, a, a small level, so you're not shifting them hundreds of miles, uh, that's, that's probably okay. The problem with assisted migration is if you take something from the deep south and move it up north, we still have cold snaps. Climate change is really about increased climate variability rather than this slow warming that you hear about. Yes, on average, the temperature is slowly warming on average, but we still get these wild swings uh, including those real cold snaps. Remember two years ago, the uh, the freeze that went even down into Mexico, that was so cold, it killed a bunch of native plants that belong down there. So anything we've moved north during those, those swings uh, will, will die. I would rather uh, increase 
or maintain the genetic variability in our plant populations as best we can, which means minimize the use of the cultivars that have zero genetic variability in them. Uh, and, and hope there's enough out there so that when you get the cold snaps, when you get the heat and the drought and the floods and everything else, some of the plants make it. Those will be the future uh, genotypes that, that make it in this highly variable world. Uh, I was told there's a season to trim your keystone oaks, spring, fall, or winter. When's the best time to do any trimming on oaks? You know, I'm not an arborist. I don't want to give you misinformation. I know you don't want to do it during the, the growing season because that encourages um, the spread of oak wilt and some of these other oak diseases having the open scars. So I'm pretty sure it's the dead of winter, but you really should check with a, a real life arborist about that. <laughs> um, let's see. I solved that problem by not pruning my oaks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, someone's commenting, following up on climate. I live in Chicago, but the plants where I went to school in Champaign don't always do well here. I love the flowering dogwood, one zone down. <laughs> so that's the, that's the gardener's dilemma, the, the wanting of certain things that, <laughs> you know, the collecting. <laughs> I didn't talk about it, but there is room for compromise. Yeah. There is room for compromise. We can't compromise with invasive plants, but <clears throat> if you have a favorite plant, you can't do without it and it's not invasive, go ahead and plant it. It's okay. Um, I think that wraps up our questions and it's close to the end of our time with you. Doug, thank you so much for joining us this year. I think, um, you know, you're... The information you've presented, I mean, this is, it's its not the best news, but I think focusing on, as you said, what we can, each one of us can do in our own little piece of the earth can make a world of difference. You know, my, my wife said to me the other day, she said, you've got to, you've got to be more positive. You got to stop with these things. <laughs> She said, put together a talk of solid successes and, and I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Um, so that sorry about the bad news, but we got to motivate you. There's real, real problems out there. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. And then when you do put together that presentation, we'd love to have you back. <laughs> okay, all then right. we can have a little celebration party. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know. Well, send me success stories. How about that? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Doug. Right. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your summer, which is quickly turning to fall. <laughs> it certainly is. All right, yeah. take care. Take care, everyone.